Thank you everyone for coming. Uh, we'll get started, I guess. Um, so we're here to, uh, to speak about something big that's just uh, landed uh, a few weeks ago. Is, uh, we are finally getting right packages. Um, so we'll go to the, you know, the usual, uh, why do we do want to do that, and what's, what the challenge is, and what's, what we currently have, what's upcoming. Uh, we'll tell you about some of the issues that we are foreseeing. You will tell us about the issues that we have not foreseen. And all of us together will find a solution for making this work somehow. Uh, so who we are, uh, I'm Pingu. You may have known me before. You may have seen me at previous vlog, not the one last year. Uh, I work in the Federal Infrastructure Team, uh, and I'm leading the, the Ride Getting uh, Initiative. And with this, I'm working closely with Dominic, who's going to introduce himself. Oh, yeah. I'm the Fedora CI Objective Lead, and I'm also, I work for Red Hat. I'm a manager in the Fedora CI space and also in the RHEL space for those who work for Red Hat. You may have already seen me. So this is uh, all nice and, uh, nice and easy. You know who we are. We know what we talk. But uh, why are we doing this? Well, the, the answer is easy. Uh, we want uh, RAI to be more stable. We want RAI to be something that people can actually use on a day-to-day -day basis and stop with the, with the idea that RAI eats your babies and uh, you, should not, uh, you shouldn't touch it. And it's OK to break rawhide. It's OK for RAI to be broken for weeks in a row. Uh, because that actually is not. Uh, just think of it as uh, rawhide is our master branch. There is a reason why uh, you know, Rawhide is our master branch. There is actually no real reason for that. But if you think of it as your master branch, you actually don't want your master branch to be broken all the time. You have CI for that. You, you fix things. You want, you, you want your master branch to be working all the time. So that's, there is no reason for Fedora not to have this state as well. So we want to have a more stable ride, a stable uh, master branch. We want to have Compose working in Rawhide. There is frequent time where Composes in Rawhide are broken for days, if not weeks in a row. And when composes don't happen in RAID, when the compose fail in RAID, that means that no updates are getting pushed, which means that all the builds that we, you have nicely been working on, all the updates that you have nicely been working on, are not getting pushed to any of the people who actually run RAID. And we do have some of these heroes, and there is even one staying in the first row here. Thank you, Kevin, for running RAID. <laughs> So every time we break the compose, Kevin cannot get his, uh, his latest uh, package. So he's very sad, and that makes him you know. And when Kevin is sad, it makes us sad as well. Uh, there is a side thing on this: is that if we make Rawhide more stable, we'll actually get a benefit at the federal branching points. When if Rawhide is stable and composes, when we branch from Rawhide to do our beta release, that branch is also going to be more stable. We'll, we will stop having to run and make heroic efforts to actually fix our branching model and get beta out there just to compose. Uh, and you know, faster update release, that's uh, basically what I was saying. Uh, in Rawhide, if you don't compose, you don't get updates. Uh, so we want to, we want to avoid that. Uh, there is also a side effect of this, is that when currently you dump something in Rawhide and that breaks the world, uh, you know, you can go on your weekends and enjoy and have fun, or you can go on PTO and leave people with a broken Rawhide for weeks. Uh, so we want to get a little bit in the mindset of, well, if you break it, you fix it. Uh, but if you were at Neil's talk yesterday, you may, you may remember that he was pointing out that not everybody can fix things, and that's where Alexandra is definitely right, where we want to increase the teamwork in Fedora with, if you want if you're working on something which is of significant importance and you don't have all the access that you need to, well, then you need to actually reach out to the people who, who are maintaining the part, the part that you can't touch and work with them to make sure that the, the entire uh, of your change with the dependencies is still working and passing. Um, but if you do have the power, if you have a proven packager, well, you know, then you, you have no excuse to actually fix what you break. Um, a bunch of our contributors are volunteers. Most of our contributors, some of them working at Red Hat as well, are volunteers. They are contributing to Fedora on their spare time, weekends, evenings, PTOs. We cannot dump something in Rawhide and let something else take their time off to actually fix what you break. There is no reason for me to push something in Rawhide that breaks the world and let someone else, contribute. who is a contributor, who is giving a, the project free time to go after my mess and clean it up. So. We have to be careful. When people say on the, on the devil list, and if you follow it, you, you've seen that before, it's OK for a lie to be broken. No, it's not. 
It's not. If you, f if you break it, you fix it. If it's okay for a part of right to be broken, but that part of right should not affect the entire project. It's not okay for me to break your work when, you work, when you're contributing freely on your, on your own time. So what are the ch challenges uh, to make this happen? Well, the first thing is, uh, as I've started, it's, it, has been a long, it has been a long process. We have been trying to make right more stable for years now. We have been speaking about getting right packages for a long time. So the first challenge that we had, that we were facing, was just let's make it, let's make it happen. Let's actually gate right packages. Um, but we have a few, we have a few conditions for that. We have a few requirements. We want to actually fit into in the existing tooling. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. We don't want to create a new build system. We don't want to integrate a new body part. Uh, so we want to fit into our existing infrastructure. Uh, we also want to interact as little as possible the packages workflow, and that's something which is deterrent because. As I say, contributors contribute on their free time, and the more change we impose on them, the more chance we have to drive them away, or it's going to take them more time, and it's going to be less interesting for them. So we need to be careful about the experience there. So we need uh, a smooth uh, user experience. That doesn't mean there's the, there is going to be zero changes. I mean, we are changing the way our packaging workflow works in Fedora, so there will be changes to the packager workflow, but we want to, to try to have them as minimal as possible. And then there is a big challenge as well, which is going to be on, so on the, a lot on Alexandra and Dominic, is uh, the false positive side. How do we make sure that the tests are sending proper results, that we don't have package that are blocked by, because the test is faulty, rather than because the test is valid and the package should be blocked. Uh, that is a metaphysical question that happens with every and any CI. Uh, if you've played around with CI, you know, you know, with testing in general, you know about uh, false positive and the issue they grow on. So how do we plan to do that? Well, we plan to do to roll out in phases. We start with a smaller change and then try to go for the bigger one. Uh, we want your feedback as early as possible. Uh, even when we did the, the change proposal to Fesco, we did a call for a feedback on the devel list, and we actually got very good input there. Uh, some, of the, some of the inputs we already had in our mind, but they were not properly worded in the change proposal. Some of the inputs we had uh, missed, so we had it. And we actually definitely want a, a, polished user, a polished user experience. So where we are, we are, in the, we are currently getting single build updates in Rawhide. So how does it work? So that's basically the entire workflow of it works. It's unreadable, I know. It's meant to be <laughs> unreadable here. Uh, just the idea, you have the user is on the right. You have 10 systems behind it. Hopefully, most of them, as you can see, the user does not interact with them. This is the simplified version of it, uh, so it's the one I'm going to run you through. When the packager does a build, it lands into a certain tag in Koji. The, a tool called RoboSignatory takes the build, signs it, and moves it to, to a secondary tag. There, Koji's uh, body sees it, creates an update from it, waits for the CI system to report that the, the, the build the update is, te is tested and the test passed, or the update is not tested and therefore it should not be gated. And if, if everything is good, it moves into the, the right uh, build and tag, and you get uh, your usual right experience. Um, I'm going to be digressing a little bit from, uh, from this workflow uh, here, just to, to go through the, the decision making. So how does the... Just to, to reiterate on that, like the first... The first uh, just to, to emphasize this part, the first step is one where you actually make the decision and the rest is automatic. So it might be complicated, but like by default, these things will just go through. So no, no watching and, and shepherding things through the process. Um, Dominic is, is definitely right. It's all automatic. The other thing that uh, to consider is what changes from the current workflow before getting is basically the second box here. We were, we were using two tags, we are, only, we are using three. We did not use body, we are now using body for uh, in ride. That's basically the, the amount of change we've done. Um, so I wanted to go a little bit on uh, how the, the CI system makes a decision, what can go in, what cannot. Um, so we have the CI system that is running the test. The test lands into uh, an application that is called ResultsDB. Um, so before I go to, this, uh, to, the, to this, I'm going to the three applications which are key and the three names to keep in mind are ResultsDB, GreenWave, and RiverDB. These are the three items which are used to make a decision. 
So the CI system sends the, the test results to ResultsDB. It's just a database which exposes a JSON API that says, well, this build passed this test, this test, this test, this not pass that test, that test, that test, and so on. So every entry in the database is about an item that was tested, uh, Koji build in, uh, in our case, and the test that was tested and the outcome of the test, as well as the URL, which is handy when you actually want to send the user, well, it failed, and this is the log where you can find uh, why it failed. Then we have GreenWave, which is a, it's a decision making, it's a policy engine. It goes through a set of rules, and based on the result it finds in ResultDB, it makes a decision. For this, it has two sources for making a, a decision. One, it's its own configuration file, which is managed in the, the Fedora infrastructure, uh, which contains policies, rules that would be applicable to every package in Fedora. So if you were at uh, David and Tim Flink's talk yesterday about RPM Inspect, if one day RPM Inspect becomes stable enough and ready enough and useful enough for the community to say, well, we want RPM Inspect to pass on every single package in Fedora, we will put that in GreenWave's own configuration file. Currently, there is nothing in GreenWave's configuration file. Everything is in this git, in the package specific. So you can have uh, per package, uh, you can make a decision per package, what are the tests that I want my package to be gated on? So, which means that if you don't want your package to be gated on, you just don't tell GreenWave to get on this, and that's it. So it's entirely up to you at the moment. Uh, so you put in your disk repo a getin.yml file, there is documentation online on how to do that. That's what I was missing, I wanted to add a link to that documentation in the, in the slides. Uh, so I'll have to do that. Um, so you put a getting.yml in your disk repo that tells GreenWave, I want to test, I want to gate on these and these results. When GreenWave receives a, a new result about uh, your package from ResultsDB, it checks that file and it says, well, are all the rules satisfied? Yes, no, I'm missing some, and it, it will announce that. Uh, but he listens to GreenWave messages, and every time the GreenWave announces, well, this build can go through, it checks, is there an update corresponding to this build? Yes, the update goes to stable. Is, if the update is not, uh, if the build did not pass CI, then uh, GreenWave's uh, body say, well, you know, it's, it blocks and the user can go and they can waive the test results. So waiving is basically saying, well, I have checked the test results and I know they fail, but they should not fail. This is a false negative. It shouldn't, it sh they should be passing. It could be something in the CI system itself. There was a network issue, there was hard drive issue, there was, could not talk some, something. So we try to minimize that, except that, you know, Schrodinger and Scat and Murphy's Law being what they are, it happens. Uh, one of the ways we want to, in the, in the future, avoid waving tests is being able to re-trigger a test. So if you have a network issue, you should be able, well, looking at the logs, this doesn't look like an error in the test. So let's rerun them and see if that passes th that time. But sometimes you end up in a situation where you actually want to, to wave the results. And that's why WaverDB does. You, are, you as a user, you say to, to, to WaverDB, that test result here can be ignored. Then GreenWave will receive the notification from WaverDB. It will again pull the data about your, uh, your build from uh, ResultsDB and say, well, if I ignore that test, everything else is clear. So that update can go through. At which point Body picks up the message and says the update can go to stable. So I just included some links here. Uh, you probably don't want to click on them because they are, they are APIs. They are meant to be uh, consume, consumed by computers and not really much by human. ResultDB has some sort of UI on top of it, which makes the JSON uh, prettier than the, the GreenWave and WebDB, which are really meant to be uh, just uh, used by, uh, by uh, by uh, computers. But if you're ever curious of uh, where they are, where they live, how they look like, you can uh, feel free to have a look at them. Yeah, maybe um, from my hand wavy perspective, just some of the, the background for this is um, this is actually a pretty nice differentiation between the tools that implement this and the policy, right? So even I, who don't know about these tools specifically, I can go in and understand what the rules are, right? I can, if I'm a packager, I can put a rule in my package saying what I want to be gated on. I have control over that. As a, looking at Fedora as a whole, for Fesco or the community, we can set policy, central policy that applies to everything without changing these tools again. And as a packager and, or a proven packager or whatever, I can, 
I can use a waving mechanism to say, whatever these tools are telling, I know better, right? Because we, we should trust our judgment and our experience here over these tools. So you can, that's what the waving mechanism is for. So we have, we can, you can set the policy for your packages, distro-wide, or you, have the, you also have the control to wave and say, say, this is what the result should be and not what the tools are saying, just to kind of summarize these, these levels. Um, so I just wanted to come back to the to the waving part a little bit. So we still want this to be the last resort, but we understand that uh, sometimes it's not. Uh, and to make the, the the user experience, waving is actually pretty easy. You have the, the body CLI and you can just say, well, body updates wave, and then you put the GID identifier of the body update and a comment on why you were waving it this. Uh, my favorite test, uh, when I, I have a test that you know, goes through the entire pipeline and make sure that everything works. And the comment is, this is fine. You know, you probably want to have a, something a little bit more descriptive <laughs> because you actually want to, we want to be able to go back to these waivers and say, well, why was it waived? Uh, it was waived because of that tool did not behave as expected because there was a networking issue, because there was an ad drive issue, because I know better than the tool. Um, me, as an example, uh, we use this internally as well. And, uh, and at least in the beginning, the most common used uh, comment for the waiver was, this is an example waiver. That's, you can use that, but um, like looking back, things to trying to understand why exactly you did waive that, that test result a month ago, that's gonna take some debugging. So it's like kind of like to do add comment or to do <laughs> add description. Like you don't, just don't do that, please. And the, the, the one thing I wanted to point out is that when you use uh, body update wave, you can wave fail tests, but you can also wave missing tests. Uh, that's especially important at this time where things are still in progress, we can't re-trigger the tests yet. Uh, so if for some reasons the CI pipeline or something else broke and no results are showing up after you know a certain time, you are able to say, well, you know what, just let that update go through and I know that something is wrong here, it has been reported, uh, let's just go through so that I can keep on with my work. So we got some early feedbacks. The, the first one is that it works, so yay! <laughs> the, the second one was that if you do a single update in Rawhide, it currently get between five to seven emails. And for people who do you know, a number of significant work in Rawhide, that is a little bit of, a little bit too much information to buy emails to receive. Um, there is something else that we found out, that's actually not a feedback, but something we found out is that if you use build root overrides, you end up, um, I need to go back here, you end up in a different tag than any of these ones, which means basically nothing, so you will end up in, you will end up in a different tag here, which means nothing is moving your build into the next stage automatically, which ends up be making basically the update being, the build being stuck. So, Currently, this is work in progress. Currently, do not use build root overrides. Don't. You shouldn't need them because everything goes through and you don't need them. If you need them, that basically means you probably are looking for a multi-build update situation, in which case you actually don't want to opt in into getting yet because this is not currently released. Uh, so we, we don't support that. So we only support single build. So if you're looking at a multi-build uh, build root overrides, there is probably something wrong here. Uh, something we clearly saw was that we released uh, single package getting on, on Wednesday and it was right in the middle of the, the mass uh, release for F31, um, the master builds. And when the builds landed into the, si the, the signing tag, uh, well, you know, when you have 20,000 builds, the robust signatory takes them one by one and where you sign, yes, no. Where you sign, yes, no. Well, it takes a little bit of time. And when the queue is filled with 20,000 builds, it means that your right builds that are coming next to it, so they are just one in the queue. And it can take a little bit of time until your one in the queue comes up to be the next one in the queue, or the one that is currently being processed. So we will need to make some adjustments about signing mass builds. Uh, how it's going to look like, we don't know yet. Uh, can we have dedicated signing? We don't know. Can we have a worker-based uh, model for signing? Uh, it's up in here. That's something we have realized with, you know, rolling this out. Uh, I'm happy that we're finding it out now rather than later on because that will also impact the multi-build uh, getting. Uh, 
uh, but that is something we need to, to fix. On the roadmap, uh, we are st we're still working on uh, you know, polishing the single build experience w as well as working on the, the multi-build updates. Uh, so I'm happy to tell you that uh, currently in body in Git, uh, we have fixed it so that for row height updates, you will only get between two and three emails, depending on if you test pass or not, instead of five to seven, so less emails for you. Uh, we may still go to reduce that. Uh, we have kept some email notifications because we think they are interesting. If you know, the community thinks that they really are not interesting, then uh, we can always look at uh, reducing that number again. Uh, we have also fixed the, the build root override issue. So if you end up using them, you shouldn't need them again, but if you do, then we actually have ways to unstuck you. Hey, I have one, maybe one comment also on the emails. Uh, what we're looking at is also to see um, if we have a CI dashboard, you know, where, where is the trade-off to see what is useful to people, whether you want to opt into emails or whether you want to rather check on a, on a dashboard. But I think that's the balance we'll have to, have to find and kind of iterate on. So when you see things happening there, watch the, the lists um, and give your feedback on what's useful to you. Um, one other thing that we know are, we are currently missing is uh, when you create an update for a certain build, you have no way of monitoring what's going on. And, but the CI pipeline actually announced, hey, I'm currently starting to work on this, on this build. So we actually want to be able to comment on the body update saying, well, hey, if you're interested, this is where your tests are being running. You can monitor them over there. Uh, so that's something which we have in the pipeline. It's, I haven't put it in a roadmap here, but it is something which we have uh, in our head and that we want to get uh, uh, sooner rather than later. Okay, and the next big thing that we are working is the, the multi-build update. Um, so this is, again, how it looks. You know, and again, it's unreadable, and again, it involves 10 systems, and again, I have made a simplified version of it. <laughs> so uh, the user has to do a little bit more work here. The first step that you do is uh, you create a site tag. So a site tag is going to be the place where you do your work in an isolated environment from everything else in Rawhide, so that, and it will contain everything you want to have tested. So you create your site tag. It's going to be a uh, fed packet just landed the, the work on this uh, Libomir, which I'm not seeing in the audience uh, as, uh, as put it off. Um, so you would be able to do a fed package site tag request or create, I forgot exactly what was the syntax, uh, that would automatically create a site tag for you in, uh, in Koji. Then you will do your usual uh, git commit, uh, uh, git commit, git push, fed package build, but there you need to use the dash dash target and use the site tag that you've created as a target for your build. Once you're all done, so you have you know, 10, 5, 20, 100 packages that you have rebuilt, you will go to Koji, to, sorry, to Body, and you will say, please create an update from this site tag, and you will pass in the name of your site tag. Body will interact, will uh, interrogate Koji and say, well, what are the builds? There you see. <laughs> what are the builds that are present in, uh, in, that, in this site tag? And it will come up with a list of the builds. It will move them to a dedicated uh, signing pending tag where robust signature will be pick them up, sign them, move them to a testing tag, at which point body will pick up the, the, the list of builds again and will send a notification to the CI pipeline. This site tag with these builds are ready to be tested. The CI pipeline will do its magic and will report to usual TB, GreenWave, we come back to the, us the usual suspects, and GreenWave will tell you, you know this list of builds that you tell me about, this site tag, they are all good to go. I have a question on the back. Will it be possible to set uh, specific tests for a multi-build or just only on the individual packages? There, there may be cases where it would be useful to test a set. Um, we don't necessarily know which order uh, so the question is, I'm going to repeat the question while Alexandra picks up the microphone to answer it. Uh, the question is, will it be possible to actually define uh, tests for a set of packages rather than individual packages, and how we want to do that? And uh, I'm going to say two things just before giving you the microphone. First, you're pulling my next slide. That was the very last question here. And the second is uh, giving the mic, the mic to uh, Alexandra to answer it. So, so for now, the first iteration would be just that uh, a uh, site tag will pass if every of the packages in the site tag passes its individual gating policy. So that's going to be the rule because we configure a policy per component. But obviously it's not where we should stop and uh, there are talks about how we implement the more generic gating policy but 
we need to really work on the place for it and the uh, like the way how to define it. So basically, uh, we it's not technically too complicated to define a, a additional rules, but we really need to figure out the uh, user experience around it, where to put it, how to update it, how people are going to manage that. So if you're interested in this topic, follow Fedora CI, Fedora develop con conversations and provide uh, feedback and participate. I think one, one aspect to also think about there is why would you want specific tests for, for a set of updates? Like, why should they not be part of the individual packages as well? Um, Yeah, so the answer from Stephen was that there, there are ecosystems out there that have a whole set of tests. And I know that we had the, like the, the talk yesterday about the Fedora server, um, saying that came up as well. So I think the, the, the trade-off there to think about is, is it, is it another test I want to add to specific packages or sets of packages? Or is it something um, I want to monitor specifically as a separate test, for example, say I have RPM inspect running on the entire distro. I have the CI pipeline running for all tests that have pa for all packages that have tests in diskit, but I might also have a separate test that's called uh, Fedora server that provides feedback if any number of packages are or a specific set of packages are involved. So I think there are multiple models that we can think about. And for now, I would say what you can do is definitely add tests to the packages involved um, and start from there. So the there, there, there has been sort of an reflection about getting composes, and I actually believe, and Mohan, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that GreenWave already tests and publishes decisions on composes if they can be go through or not. Okay. So, so Mohan confirms that actually our composes are already getting in with the same tooling. Yeah, so, so getting composes is definitely uh, a good augmentation. I think what it shouldn't replace is testing before something actually lands. Because this, this is the point where we can affect a change before it breaks someone else. And I think that's, that's a place we all want to be, where we're not under what time pressure. There was another question here. Yeah. What, what is the expectation for how much time these tests are supposed to run? So the question is, what is the expectation for how much time these tests run? Um, so I have a, I have a package that is, uh, so the Fedora Gather Easy Fix, if you want to look it up. It has a very simple test.yaml that all, all that this does is calling the fail module from Ansible. So it just, you know, directly start and crash. Uh, so that I can test the actual getting mechanism. And that overhead is about eight minutes. Um, I'm not asking that, so, but I know. Mm -hmm. I'm asking what is acceptable. So, uh, because for pre IPA, for example, I can easily pick up and, and run all the battery of uh, upstream tests mm -hmm. that six hours parallelize it across maybe 40 nodes. So, hours but then I get real assurance that this stuff works because it runs thousand something uh, real deployment type cases. Uh, where is the balance? So the, the question was about how long should actually tests run, what's acceptable. I think that varies per package because essentially what you're doing as a maintainer is you're saying, I'm willing to wait this long for my change to go in. Like, how sure do you want to be? I think the answer is probably going to be different um, whether you test Bash or whether you test GCC or something that's more complex and that involves a lot of other components. So I think... That's, that's why I'm asking about yeah. what is acceptable. We need to have a policy um, 
as, as uh, approaching? I think, I think where the, the policy, so the question was about the policy. Um, where this comes in is in, and I'll touch on this in the Fedora C objective talk later when we talk about depend, reverse dependency testing and when you actually start testing or running tests from other packages. Um, the, the short answer is as long as it needs, it'll take as long as it needs to take. A, a good guideline is that, like this is essentially, if we look at this as part of the developer workflow, if it takes more than an hour or two, that's, that starts to feel really long. More than a day, that's really questionable as to how useful that feedback is. But it's, that shouldn't be, like, for example, if the infrastructure goes down, you shouldn't say, oh, this takes too long. Let's just wave everything. Like, that's also the flip side, right? So that's why the guideline is still as long as it needs to take. If you think a test is essential, then that's how long it takes. If you say it's not essential, then it doesn't need to be included. So we have in creating a case, we have already embodied uh, integration with the open key. And the tests that open key runs on um, IDF updates and reverse dependencies, there's a list of packages and triggers to like Samba and NSS and whatnot there. It's about one hour for everything, including the um, uh, upgrade of the operating system for client and the server and rebooting machines in the process. Um, if we are adding the same to localite, that, that's, that's probably okay. But if we are adding or wanting to add something more, that probably should be post gate, uh, post compose thing that, that sort of reports back that more rare use cases fail. Mm -hmm. Well, the differentiation between rare and, and not so rare is, is a valid one, I think. But the question is, like, you shouldn't ask, like, the question you have to ask yourself here is not, not how long should I have to wait, but what happens if I don't catch something and everyone else can't use Rawhide because of what I did? Right. I think that's, that's the honest, that's, that's the hidden cost, mm -hmm. right? Blocking everyone else and breaking everyone else's workflow. Did you want to I would question the uh, uh, claim that there should be a unified policy on the time of testing, actually. Because uh, the good thing about gating is that uh, the while you haven't landed in the Compose yet, this is your part of the process and you don't block other people from doing their, jo their stuff on the Compose. So it uh, actually gives you a freedom to decide for yourself and for your level of uh, involvement how uh, much you are okay with, with uh, waiting and how b beneficial these tests are for you. So uh, I, wouldn't, uh, I would say our current uh, framework allows us a full flexibility. We can uh, use various CI systems in various cases. You can configure them per component, per group of component. Uh, so there is a freedom in that. We uh, need to have certain guidelines on generic tests, but for component-specific tests, uh, we actually can allow very different policies for people. I'm not asking about the global policy. I'm asking about recommendations. I would, I would say this is, si since the So when, when it comes to package time, the time it takes to run the test, I would say since the tests are in your hands, it depends on how long you're willing to wait, to wait for it. If you start to affect other people because, for example, you, you, make, you make it so that your test runs on your dependencies without consulting with the people that are maintaining these dependencies, then it's probably a problem, but that's something that you need to communicate with these people. And if you say, well, free IPA, Run, tests run for six hours, and that's only impact, and all the people that are working on free IP, IP, IPA are okay with that, then I think it's, it's fine. If the OpenSSL folks say, well, I don't want to wait for six hours, and I would rather that we, you do the one hour side, then maybe you can do the one hour side for the OpenSSL and the six hour for the free IPA. I think that there it's a matter of yeah, communication. You, you need to have different places where you define individual tests. Yeah. So what, what, I think two things here, one is, what will probably help is, if, especially if you have do more testing and become more involved, 
let's look at the, the Fedora CI SIG to kind of have that exchange with others who do this to kind of see what works and what doesn't work. And also, based on my experience at least, the, the lowest amount of time you should wait is slightly more than the, dev than the developers are comfortable with. <laughs> um, if you ask someone how long are you willing to wait for test results, you should definitely wait longer. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's kind of the, the, low, the lower bar. So how could so you're thinking that something that the, so the question is what happened with what happened if free IPA uh, lands in raw height? Something with long test from test frame and it's like so doesn't that so mean what break what happened if something with a long test suite uh, lands in the right and breaks raw height in a way that was not caught by the long test suite? So you have to wait for x amount of time before a new a new build arrives and lands. And I would point out that. Yep, there it is. You can always wave missing results. For, for example, if something... So if, if you need to go something quickly through... You, you can wave results before they're in. You can wave missing results. Okay, so, the, okay, so you can short-circuit yeah. right. Of course, with the caveat that saying, let me just add this quick fix that only fix one problem, definitely not introduce more, it, I would... I would recommend that you run at least a basic set of tests and use judgment uh, before yeah. waving. So, like, it's a valid case of waving. I'm just saying you should, like, especially when you use reasons as let me just do this really quick or there's a deadline or let me just add this one fix. Those are classic cases of, oops. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, 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 the complementary version of this is uh, if ride is broken for six hours, it's still better than the state it is today, where it, uh, it can end up being broken for weeks. <laughs> One small question on this. Um, is it possible to cancel? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah.
quite a bit of feedback here. Uh, there are some things that we are aware of, uh, especially with regards to the, to the multi-build. Uh, there is a question of site tag proliferation. Uh, how is Koji going to handle this? If a lot of people are using site tags in RAI to, to do their development work there, um, we, that's something which we will need to test and see how that behaves. I mean, if everybody uses site tag to do their work, I think this is a good problem to have. Uh, but that would rather that we anticipate it a little bit before then we actually hit the wall because Koji is not able to manage that. Uh, there is a big question about uh, on merging the site tags. How do we result conflicting builds? How do we provide uh, feedback to the user with instruction on how to fix that? Uh, there is the question about race condition between Koji and Body. Because Body will store the list of builds that are present in this site tag. And that's what it will send to the CI system, and that's what it will receive information about. And what happens if just before making the decision, the user realizes that, hey, something is broken, I can, I can, or I've missed that one package, and I can push it as well. Uh, then suddenly you have one more build in your site tag that Body was not aware of. So we need to be careful, very careful here, about being, being sure that what, we, what Body pushes to stable is exactly what, what is present in the site tag, and there is no we try to minimize the, the, pos the possibility of race condition between the two here. Uh, then there is the entire question that uh, Stefan has already raised was uh, how do we test site tags? We consider then the, the, the sum of all individual package tests present in the site tag. Can we create site tag specific tests? How do we handle that? So I'm not going to go back to it because Alexandra already covered it. Uh, we also have some point of attention for testing itself and I'm going to let Dominic on that one. Yeah, maybe just to, to add on to the previous slide, um, so the goal here is not to have something that's perfect, right? We want to have something that improves stability and makes things, makes our world a better place. And there will be a lot of points where we can improve this. And I think if we iterate together, it'll be better. But let's, like, the goal is not to wait until everything is finished and then have the system that solves all the problems. That would probably take a, a long time to wait for. You, you mean wait until everything is finished and then deliver the system that solves no longer problem? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, um, we're testing. There are a lot of things here that, or a lot of aspects um, that you have to think about. Like when, when, when we do have tests, we have to think about stability, right? It's like how stable are our tests? How stable is the testing infrastructure? Um, how reliable are things? All of these uh, play a role. Some of these we can influence, some of these you can influence. Some of these are easier to influence than others. So that's just, uh, I mean, we, we, like feedback's good on these things, but it's, we have to tackle specific problems to solve them, I think. Um, the impact of these tests, um, that's something to, to keep in mind. It's like when you, when you do this, of course, you're slowing down individual development, package development. Um, the benefit is not breaking others and giving yourself the time to fix things, address, the, uh, address issues. But also, as we, as we ramp up and as you contribute to tests, think about um, what does this do for others? If this is run as a reverse dependency test on other packages, can, they, can people understand the results? Can they, can they, like, do they know what this does? Can they interpret the results? How can, they, how can others contribute if they see an easy fix? Um, we are aware that we have a more than one architecture that Fedora runs on. So some tests do. Do our Fedora tests run on multi-arch right now? I don't think any do right now. Um, that is definitely something we want to do. It is a question of prioritization. So if you have a case where that is really important, you can reach out to us. And the answer will most likely contain somewhere the word contribute and please. Uh, so, so that is, we are aware that is a thing, but um, coverage and getting things in at least for one architecture is a priority we made. So if you have feedback on that decision, please reach out to us. Maintainability. Um, it is, with tests, I'll probably get to that a bit more in the, the C objective talk uh, at 3.30, but think about how maintainable tests are. Like if you add something, especially if you add a contributed test to another package, or take something to the upstream, think about what would it take to maintain that? Does it make sense? Can I augment something that exists? Can, or even can I take my tests upstream? Like even further upstream than Fedora. The further upstream, the better, for, uh, usually. And 
Otherwise, the same principles as with other code apply, like how to write maintainable code. Now, I'm already commented the, the connecting to upstream. And of course, we are aware that we don't just have packages, but also modules and containers. And these are also tested, but to different extents. Because the, the infrastructure that is, is tied to those is just different in some cases. So this is mostly a question of, of priorities. Um, not that we think one is more important than the other. Um, it's just that we, we have more RPMs right now, and they're also used for modules and containers. And so it seems a logical choice to start with the packages. And uh, with this, well, you've already been uh, very helpful, uh, but we would like to invite you to help us more. Uh, we need more, uh, more testers, give us more. Take a look at the current workflow, tell us what's right about it, tell us what's wrong about it. Don't forget the first part, please. Um, if you want to test uh, the multi-builds, uh, reach out to us. Uh, we will be looking at deploying this in staging in the coming months. Uh, so if, you, if you're interested to do, to do this, if you have a set of tests or packages you want to be looking at testing, uh, yeah, again, reach out to us. We will work with you. We will see how to, to get this working and staging with you. Uh, this is going to be a fun, uh, you know, a great fun ride. <laughs> so don't hesitate. Give us your feedback. That's, that's, the, main, uh, that's the main thing. Try, try it. Give us your feedback. Tell us what works, what doesn't, and, uh, and tell us how we can improve it. And, and also the, you know, your workflows, right? Think about what Alexandra said, said, that the freedom you have to choose what tests you run, how much to run, where to run them, use that to decide what would fit your workflow and then if you're unsure how that fits with what we've implemented, talk to us and we'll, we'll try to help you or we will help you figure out whether that fits into what we've built. If it doesn't fit, do we need to change what we've built? Maybe. Or maybe we have suggestions on what you can, could do differently and we can talk about how, how we can make it work. And with this, uh, we would like to thank you and take any questions left. Mohan. So, um, two questions. First one. Um, so, what is the process for when the CI just fail? Like when I, uh, if I say body update wave blah blah, does it automatically do uh, a push the build to the stable or do, do I need to do something else? So the question is, uh, what happens when the, the tests fail? If I do a body wave update, uh, body update wave, what happens? So when you do body update wave, which, what you're saying is you're actually sending a request uh, to WaverDB via body uh, to say, well, wave the test, the, the, the failed test. So you can, when you do a body update wave, you can specify a single test, you can specify all the tests, which is the default, uh, whether they are missing or uh, just failed. Uh, so you're sending something to WaverDB. WaverDB will send uh, a message that there was a new waiver added. GreenWave will pick this up and say, well, this, this waiver concerns that test result that concerns this package. What were the rules for that package? What were the test results for that package? If I ignored that test result that I was told, that I was just told to ignore, what's the outcome of it? If, if it's still false, then it's, nothing's gonna happen. If it becomes true, the package can, be, can go through. It will announce it, but it will pick up that and say, well, this can go through, move, to, move the update to stable, push the build to the, to the right. So the question is, uh, the question is how to, uh, is there any plans uh, to do distro level uh, testing, especially when uh, a bump spec uh, failed and some bumps, bumps uh, broken dependencies and these kind of things? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> more, more in the, uh, in the talk on the Fedorsi objective. We also have um, distro wide tests being developed right now, like the RPM inspect with uh, David and Tim that they presented and now present some more options and if you have more ideas then that's that's a perfect place to contribute because this is like the system allows you to add other systems that provide feedback and test results so there's no no single place you have to put them the the messaging system remains the same and the, the intent of this is also that we can start deploying the systems seeing the results and then deciding as a community do we want to gate on those I think that's that's the key difference. There was another question. 
No, not anymore. <laughs> we are right on time. So if there are more questions, uh, if there is one last question, then we're happy to take it. Otherwise, we're happy to let you go to the next. Okay, so if I have a lint, the, something that should be tested but the, shouldn't block the package going through, uh, is there a good way to see the results for the whole uh, distro about these like, lint yeah. style checks? So the question is how to get uh, distro-wide testing without getting. Right. Is that correct? Um, you can you can add test results to any build. You can basically run tests on anything and report the tests with the, and integrate this into results DB. They will show up in the body tests results page, uh, which is basically how Taskotron and OpenQA have been working so far. And as long as you don't document that in Greenway's policy, whether that policy is in you know some distro level one or package level one, uh, it won't be, it won't be used to make the decision about the getting process. And individual packages could opt into gating on that mm -hmm. by choice, for example. Is there a good way to see the results distro-wide? Distro -wide to see the results, that would uh, basically, yes, by results DB also all the information. So that would mean basically we need to create results DB for all the results about a certain test during a certain period of time probably and see how the trends goes. Uh, so we, there would be ways to monitor that. and. So the, uh, so the question from Alexander is, uh, in the body update page, do we show the test results that are, that are being considered for getting, or all of them? We are showing all of them. Which yeah. Okay, Mohan got the last one. <laughs> but we should stop after that. Uh, is there any Uh, is there any plans or policy about uh, not being able to waive certain tests? And Dominic seems to be very good to run, so that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that is not implemented right now. I would say in the future it would m make very much sense to restrict certain waivers, but that would be probably a decision for FESCO and the community to make. So I think technically that is possible. It is definitely not planned in the near future and would not happen without community involvement. Like with this, uh, this we need wide consensus. Yeah. It's my opinion. And I think with this we're going to close because it's uh, about time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much.